Hello, I'm Jackie Gober here again to take you through the next section of the Gospel of Matthew as our Sunday School lesson for this week. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, I'm chair of the Christian Education Committee here at Calvary Presbyterian Church in Willow Grove. And this past year, we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew in our adult Sunday School lessons. We were interrupted by COVID-19, so we're moving some of our lessons online just to finish out the book. Last week, we looked at Jesus' trial before Pilate and how Barabbas was the first person who was set free by Jesus' actions in chapter 27. In the next verses, the action moves forward as Jesus is beaten and crucified and faces a mocking crowd. As we saw last week with the references to Isaiah 53, Matthew again is building on these Old Testament references and themes in this section, drawing heavily not only from Isaiah 53, but also from the Psalms, such as Psalm 22 and 69. In chapter 27, verses 27 through 32, Jesus has just been condemned, and the soldiers take Jesus outside and start to beat him and insult him. Um, starting in verse 27, Matthew writes, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on his head. And when they had mocked him, they shook him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. This passage is always a hard one for me to read. The way the soldiers treat Jesus is truly shameful. The nature of this mockery was ridiculing his claims to be king of the Jews. The scarlet robes were signs of royalty and the crown of thorns was a perversion of his royal status. And since they were thorns, they would have dug into his face and caused pain and probably bleeding. They are mocking the idea that this man could be the ruler, the king who has come to deliver the Jews. Such weakness and pain would not be what you would expect from someone who was in a position of authority. And remember what we considered from Isaiah 53 in our last lesson. Isaiah writes that he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we have seen him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. The servant who is high and lifted up is the one whom we, by human standards, would not be considered to be favored by God. And that is exactly what's happening here. Jesus is bearing our griefs and our sorrows, and the people can't even see his majesty. They just mock him for his powerlessness in that moment. Not only do they mock his lack of authority, the soldiers go farther and spit on him and take a reed and strike him on the head. And this takes the cruelty even farther. They clearly mean to insult him and dehumanize him. You don't spit on someone if you want to show them their value. Spitting on someone shows just how much contempt you have for them. And what gets me here is just the lack of human decency shown to Jesus by the soldiers. I have this mental image of Jesus standing there, being ganged up upon by these men who dress them up for his own amusement. And when that doesn't elicit a reaction from him, they resort to physical violence. And how many of us have been victims of violence like this? Maybe not as harsh or as public as Jesus endured, but have you ever felt like your humanity was stripped away just for the pleasure of another? Have you ever been made to feel that everything you are is wrong and contemptible and that you deserve nothing but mockery? I've certainly been there at times. And this is what Jesus endured. He was truly king, and so the mock here shook at the very core of his identity. And this is what the soldiers wanted, to deliberately take away any shred of humanity he had left, and to make him feel as contemptible as they thought him to be. In this moment, Jesus is identifying himself with everyone who has ever endured unjust abuse. He knows the darkest parts of humanity, of your life, and is walking with you through it all. I think the writer of Hebrews put it best when he said, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And that's Hebrews chapter 2, starting at verse 14. You can see from that passage that Jesus knows every facet of the human existence, even the darkest parts, because he's experienced them. He became like us and entered into the most extreme suffering 
so he can be there for us as we suffer. What is even more to think about in this section? Jesus would not even have been in the best physical condition when they did this to him. In verse 26, which I did not read before, we're told that he had been scourged before he was released to the guards. We like to think that this was just a simple whipping, but it was not. It was much, much worse than that. Fleming Rutledge, in her book on the crucifixion, writes, The soldiers used a whip made of leather cords to which small pieces of metal or bone would be fastened. The victims would have had been naked, tied to a post in a position to expose the back and buttocks to maximum effect. She continues to describe how badly the skin would be torn and finishes by saying this would result not only in great pain, but also in appreciable blood loss. The idea here was to weaken the victim to a state just short of collapse or death. So as you can see from this description, Jesus would have already have been beaten within an inch of his life and now has to stand there while the soldiers treat him like a toy. He would have been weak and bleeding and probably not able to stand very well due to the immense pain from the blood loss and flesh wounds. It's no wonder that we read in verse 32 that as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. Since a person condemned to death needed to carry his own cross to the execution site, Jesus must have been so far gone that the soldiers saw that he couldn't do it alone and needed help to get it done. So let's read the rest of the story, starting at verse 33. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. And then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, with the scribes and the elders, mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. After Simon picks up Jesus's cross, they all arrive at Golgotha in verse 33. This site would have been outside of the city as these sorts of public executions wouldn't have been seemly inside the city walls. The first thing that the soldiers do is to offer him wine mixed with gall. And it seems like a strange thing to us but the gall added to the wine actually was a narcotic, and it meant to help with the pain of what Jesus had already and was going to endure. Jesus refuses the offer. He wants to be fully present and experience the full weight of what his crucifixion would entail. In verses 35 and 36, the guards take away his last earthly possessions and gamble for who gets to keep them. This connects to what's written in Psalm 22, verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Jesus' death is happening according to Old Testament pa patterns, and Matthew is careful to bring this out, further confirming Jesus as the figure that had been prophesied for ages. No one expected the Messiah to come and suffer such things, but such is the wonder of God's plan. We read in verse 35, just that they crucify him. No fanfare, just stating the fact that it happened. We are given no details about the process or what it looked like. I'm sure we've all seen pictures of Jesus hanging on the cross, but I don't think any of them do justice to what actually happened on that day of Golgotha, as I've been reading about what crucifixion is. Jesus would have arrived there a bloody mess and then would have been nailed to the wood and raised up for all to see. The physical experience must have been agony in the true sense of the word. He was already in pain, and now by being lifted up with his hands outstretched, his whole body would start to rebel against him. Breathing would be next to impossible because of the position his body was forced into, and it would have been all he could do to breathe in those moments. The body would essentially suffocate itself because of the distribution of its weight and the inability for Jesus to push himself up into a better position. Besides, there was also still the festering wounds on his body from the earlier beatings and the pain from the new ones inflicted in the act of crucifixion. His body would be cramping and thirsting and nothing could be done to relieve any of it. 
most of Matthew's first readers would have been familiar with this, and so this is probably why he doesn't go into a lot of detail. But I just wanted to drive home the point that death by crucifixion is more horrible than any of our modern minds can comprehend. Jesus is now hanging on the cross in unbelievable pain, naked and alone, with the charge, this is the king of the Jews written above him. The people around him don't even give him a break. Everyone around him mocks him and the disciples are nowhere to be found. This was often the worst part of crucifixion and a cruel touch added to an already horrific event, the mocking and abandonment. Any sense of dignity that would be assigned to Jesus' person is gone. As Isaiah 53 states, he is truly despised by men in this moment and cut off from the land of the living. Not only in the sense of his death, but also in the sense that the people rejected him to such a point that he wasn't even considered good enough to live anymore. He wasn't worth anything and so is disposable. You'll see the specific things that are being said. If you are the son of God, he is the king of Israel, all question his identity. The crowds are mocking the idea that God's anointed king would undergo such a brutal death and be displayed to the world as something inhuman and weak. R.T. France, in his commentary on Matthew, rightly states that through the superficial jibes, we are able to glimpse something of the real meaning of Jesus' death. In some sense, the crowds were right. Jesus, as the Son of God, could have come down off the cross and saved himself from an agonizing death, but he didn't. France continues to say it was precisely because he was God's Son that he could not come down. The Son of God's mission was to save sinners, and that salvation could only come from his death. Jesus' death was the cost of our sin, the penalty paid for each and every time you and I transgress his commandments. It's a sobering thing to think about the cross being the way justice was carried out for our sin. Jesus took on this burden for us, and what a horrible, costly burden it was. By his death, by each and every blow that he endured, he was setting us free from the condemnation that we rightly deserve. His ultimate resurrection shows us that, is, that he has overcome sin and death, and is the one who can bring those under the sentence of death into new life with him. So Jesus endured this horrible death, excruciating physical pain, abandonment from all his loved ones, mockery and brutality from those who remained around him. Why? There's not enough time to go into the myriads of ways that people have attempted to answer that question, but I want to suggest something that we see in Psalm 22. As I mentioned earlier in the lesson, there are many connections uh, with this psalm as Matthew goes through his crucifixion account. But I want to point out that the psalm doesn't end with the pain. It ends on a note of deliverance and triumph. Yahweh saves David from his enemies. And not only that, this great salvation leads to praise and worship of Yahweh. And so it is with Jesus. Yes, he suffered unspeakable things, but his death was not the end. God raised Jesus from the dead, and because of that, we can know the salvation of the Lord. We can know that anything we suffer in this world does not have the last word. For everything that is suffered for the Lord, every Good Friday leads to an Easter Sunday. Maybe not now, maybe not immediately, but definitely in glory when we see him face to face. To close out this lesson, I'm going to read Psalm 22. As I read it, think about Jesus speaking the words. Here are the echoes of what we have just read in Matthew. Jesus suffered great things, but won an even greater victory. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. 
they open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him, and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Let me close us in prayer. Lord, we praise you this morning for the salvation you have won for us, that the penalty for our sins is paid in full at the cross. Jesus, we thank you for your selfless love that endured even the horrors of the crucifixion. Help us to see the horrors of our own sin and remember your victory over it and to proclaim the salvation that you have won to those around us. We pray this in your name. Amen.